Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is tramping out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are scored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. It's amazing what you can find if you just stop to look for it. My name is Bernie Reddy, and I'm standing here in West Chelmsford, Massachusetts, at the ruins of the old Christopher Roby Sword Factory. This factory began around 1820. Uh, until 1820, till the Civil War, it was in the production of size. The whole village here was known as Sai Factory Village. And we're hoping to explore it today and show you what used to be here. I'm down here in the spillway, which would have been used to control the height of the water for the factory. Um, Christopher Roby was quite a man, aside from being the main employer of most of the people in West Chelmsford. He was also the postmaster. Uh, he was the state representative to Boston uh, from Chelmsford. He also formed Troop F, which was kind of like the National Guard of its day, uh, in response to the fear that the Confederates were coming down from Canada uh, to invade New England. Um, Christopher Roby lived right on the other side of Stony Brook. So why don't we take a walk over and, and look at his house. Roby had such a varied uh, uh, life. Uh, he was uh, not only a, a manufacturer of agricultural impl implements and, and edged weapons, but also uh, uh, he was a much more gentle man than uh, the, uh, his reputation as a sword maker would uh, indicate. Uh, he, uh, you look at his photograph and I think you see a, a man, he's wearing spectacles and uh, he's kind of rotund and he, he doesn't look like he's a very aggressive. Uh, and yet um, I think you can read into that a person who would be well capable of leaving his estate, such as it was at the time when he passed away, to the people of, of West Chelmsford uh, for the uh, beautification of their uh, community. Uh, someone who would do that, I think, is, uh, is uh, very public spirited uh, and uh, uh, has, would have to have an affection for his fellow townsmen. In 1820, it was Farwell that saw the potential of this site for a factory. Uh, he began producing size. He subsequently sold out to a man named Sawyer, who went into partnership with Christopher Roby. They did very well. They made quite a few size and were doing well. And in 1848, the railroad came right next to their factory. At this point, they were able to sell their product all across the United States. In fact, Christopher Roby sold most of his farm implements to the southern states. Everything was going along fine until something happened. War. During the war, uh his factory must have gone some, undergone some changes that in technology um, that would warrant uh, or that were reflected in the large volume of production that he was 
getting into. I mean, you can look at the records. Uh, there's Executive Document 99 that lists all the um, suppliers to the Union uh, during the Civil War. And um, he produced, the, the numbers of the, the contract show that he produced well over 48,000 swords for the Union. And that's not including officers' presentation swords or uh, Masonic swords or anything else. That's, this was, these were contract uh, military swords. And uh, uh, in order to produce that volume uh, with the type of steel that was required, uh, he would have been able, he would have had to have, have instituted some new uh, technology, uh, particularly the use of cast steel. Uh, Ames had done it up in Chicopee, and uh, the other manufacturers were having to, uh, there were other, I think there were more than 25 contractors supplying swords to the Union during the Civil War. And uh, the, uh, they all had to tool up to do that. And whether or not the factory was originally large enough uh, to handle uh, fabrication of cast steel, I don't know. Uh, he would have also have had to uh, add uh, brass foundry work as well. And uh, uh, the handles of swords, leather wrapping and wire twisting uh, uh, braid for the handles to meet federal specifications would uh, certainly require uh, more advanced technology than was required for a sickle or a scythe. I mean, those handles did not have to be wrapped. Uh, they, so he's going from a straight uh, forging and woodworking proposition into, a, into foundry work, uh, drawing wire, uh, uh, probably uh, creating the handles uh, with the uh, the grooves and the handles uh, on, a, on a, some sort of a pantograph lathe. Uh, all this requires uh, much more advanced technology than uh, for the production of simple agricultural tools. I'm here with Spud. Spud's been having a good time down here at the Roby Ruins. He's been playing in Stony Brook. Spud's an old dog, but he's not anywhere near as old as these ruins. When I'm down here, I feel like I'm at Stonehenge. Um, you can see this doorway right here. Through this doorway, thousands of swords were loaded onto trains to be united with Union soldiers. Uh, we don't know what happened to most of those swords, but we do know one sword. One sword went to a Union soldier named Charles Albright. Uh, General Albright was uh, a, a transplant to this town of Mock Chunk. He came to this town in 1856 and started a law practice. Because of that, uh, uh, the fact that he was born in Bucks County, uh, there isn't a whole lot of personal knowledge of him uh, before that time or uh, as far as his personal uh, past goes. Uh, we do know that he was an, uh, a man of many hats when he arrived in Jim Thorpe. He was a lawyer. Then he became a, a soldier, he became a statesman, he became a, a, a bank president, part owner in a bank. He became a, a foundry owner. Uh, his foundry, uh, which was called the Mock Chunk Foundry, produced shells, and they were said to be some of the best shells that were produced um, in a private concern during the Civil War. So the general had his uh, friends and allies in the town, but he also had his enemies. He would have had uh, enemies. Um, that, uh, that were opposed to the war effort. And uh, the general, as we've been saying, was pro-Union, pro-Lincoln, and he wanted to see an end to this war and to see it ended uh, by any means, uh, and that meant, meant uh, by military means. They, they termed buckshots was in the Hazleton area. The, a lot of them were rev revolting against the, the method of the draft. 
if you had $300 in the beginning of the war, you could buy yourself an exemption. You didn't have to go or assign someone else to go. Uh, Mr. Gowan of the Philadelphia Reading Railroad, he was an attorney in, in Pottsville at the time. He elected to pay his $300. So someone went in this place. Let's exaggerate. Let's say that person was killed. Let's say now it was your turn to go and you didn't have the $300. How would you feel? Or some of the very the first men who volunteered for three-month duty were sent into Harrisburg, and the rules changed. They said, now, thank you, gentlemen, you're in here for three years. So, you, number one, you wouldn't have the $300, and you wouldn't have, you, had, you resent someone tricking you into going in for three years rather than 90 days. So there's a lot of, a lot of resistance. And, as, and the miners were saying, why should we go down south and, and free those slaves? We're slaves here. Then those slaves will come up and take our jobs. So they weren't really uh, in sympathy with the, with the war effort, and they were violently opposed to the method of the, of the draft. The feeling in Mock Chunk during the Civil War was so strong and so fractured as far as peace Democrats wanting a, a quick end to the war versus the, uh, the Union forces of, uh, of a Lincoln and a General Albright who wanted to pursue this uh, to the end and win a, a decisive battle or put a decisive ending to this war uh, on the battlefield and not in any kind of negotiations. Therefore, uh, General Albright uh, would have been on a corresponding basis with President Lincoln. In fact, in 1863, things were so bad in the coal regions surrounding this town that uh, General Albright appealed to the president uh, to send in forces, federal forces, in order to police the coal fields because they were disrupting the coal shipments out of this area. Coal, coal was very crucial during the Civil War uh, to the war effort because it fueled the steamboats and it had to do with fueling the factory and the machinery of war was dependent on coal and fuel at that time. So General Albright, who had a foundry in town, was cognizant of the fact that uh, these coal fields were being sabotaged in cases, people were being murdered, mine bosses were being threatened. So he appealed to, to uh, the governor first and it went to appeal all the way to President Lincoln. And because of that pressure, uh, by General Albright especially, federal troops were sent here in 1863. In the fall of 1863, the 10th New Jersey Regiment was dispatched to Mock Chunk. One company was dispatched to this town and also to six other locations located around us in the coal regions. So they patrolled the coal regions, made arrests. Arrests were made of uh, disruptive, uh, what they felt were Irishmen, and uh, at the time they were known as Buckshots. They had the name of Buckshots, and this name in future years would become known as, was to become known as the Molly Maguires. General Albright uh, started as a major when the war opened, and uh, he, by the war's end, he became a brevet general. So he was Carbon County's highest ranking soldier in the Civil War. Uh, due in part uh, to a lot of brave actions that he saw at places like Antietam and Fredericksburg and South Mountain. He was known as a, a, a fearless, fiery type leader and a no-nonsense soldier. So when you hear of a person like maybe a Patton, maybe you could say that General Albright was in that kind of vein. He was no-nonsense and he was a good leader of men. I'm standing here at Antietam Battlefield, where on the morning of September 17, 1862, the 132nd Regiment Pennsylvania Volunteers came out of the East Woods, way back in here, came by the Roulette Farm, which you can see down the lane, and came up over these small ridges. Now this regiment had only been in existence for three or four weeks. 
This was their first taste of battle. As it would turn out, this battle would be the bloodiest battle ever fought one day in the history of the United States. Uh, as they came up over this ridge here, they were met by a barrage of gunfire from the Confederates fortified in this sunken lane right here. Now as you can see looking down this lane, it looks like a natural fortification and for hours it was. The men of the 132nd had to hug the top of the hill, pop up and shoot, go down again and others would pop up and so on and so on for four hours. What eventually happened in the bloody lane was instead of becoming a great fortification which they thought it was, it turned into a death trap for the Confederates. A Union regiment outflanked them, got around so that they were firing right down the side and all you had to do was shoot a bullet down there and you were sure to hit somebody. All the Confederates were in here. It was a massacre. Uh, the leader of the Confederates was taken out, put under a tree where he died and before he died he said to the Union soldiers, you've killed all my boys. All my boys are dead. And when they stormed over the battlements here, sure enough, all the Confederates here were dead. They were piled three and four high right in this lane. And it has the name Bloody Lane. And uh, some of the fiercest fighting of the war took place right here. I'm standing here at a statue to the 132nd Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry at Bloody Lane. The picture on the front of the monument is to Colonel Oakfit. He was killed right in the opening minutes of this battle. Uh, this monument is here as a tribute to the bravery of the 132nd Regiment charging over this hill with the Confederates down here at point blank range decimating their ranks. They showed unbelievable courage. Um, the statue on the top shows a flag bearer with a, a broken staff, a flag with a broken staff. And when we go to Frederick, Fredericksburg, I will explain the story behind that flag and flag staff. Uh, it also deals with the 132nd. After this battle at Bloody Lane, Major Albright was promoted to lieutenant colonel for bravery shown on the be shown on the battlefield Standing here on the sunken road at Mary's Heights overlooking the city of Fredericksburg. It was from these fortifications that the Confederates poured down shots onto the Union Army. General Burnside had successfully crossed the Rappahannock River and driven the Confederates out of Fredericksburg. The citizens of Fredericksburg had fled and the city was empty as the Union forces came to this hill. Wave after wave of Union forces tried to take Mary's Heights unsuccessfully. Lieutenant Colonel Charles Albright led the second wave up the hill. Um, the Confederates were firing so heavy down on the men that as they came up the hill, they were turning as somebody would turn in a hurricane to avoid the rain, only this time they were turning and coming up the hill to avoid gunshots. No Union soldier made it up to Mary's Heights. Uh, it was a complete disaster for the Union Army. The, the Confederate artillery officer was asked if he had the hill covered. And his statement was, I've got that hill so covered 
that a chicken couldn't live on it. After valiantly trying to scale these heights, the 132nd Pennsylvania Infantry retreated back down the mountain. Uh, they were taking cover anywhere they could, behind dead bodies, uh, abandoned buildings. It was an extremely cold day here in Fredericksburg on December 13th, and the wounded were freezing to death, crying out, asking for help. It was a very long, long night. Uh, eventually, General Burnside called a retreat, and the Union forces went back across the Rappahanna River. In this unsuccessful attempt to scale Mary's height, the Union Army lost over 15,000 men. And they are buried right up here at the top of the hill at Fredericksburg National Cemetery. I'm standing here at Corporal Walker's gravesite. Corporal Walker is the only known member of the 132nd Regiment buried here. All the other men of the 132nd Regiment that died scaling Mary's Heights have been buried here and their graves are unknown. Um, in those graves are six men who carried the flag of the 132nd Regiment. At Antietam Battlefield, at the Bloody Lane, there is a monument to the 132nd. On the top of that monument is, the, is a statue of a soldier holding a flag with a broken staff. That was taken from the assault on Mary's Heights here at Fredericksburg. Six men, each time they were shot down, another man would grab the flag, and six men were killed scaling Mary's Heights, just keeping that flag from touching the ground. The last person that carried that flag was found in a church in Fredericksburg, dead with the regimental flag. I'm here in Virginia at the scene of the Battle of Chancellorsville. Um, if I can give you a little background as to how this battle took place. After the defeat of the Union Army in Fredericksburg, uh, General Burnside was replaced with Fighting Joe Hooker from Massachusetts. Uh, Joe Hooker had a brilliant uh, battle plan devised where he was going to move down the Rappahanna River outflank Lee and come up behind him at Fredericksburg. Uh, Lee showed his brilliance once again in the fact that he divided his army in front of superior forces. Hooker had about twice as many men as Lee had, yet Lee still divided his army and brought a part of his army over towards Chancellorsville to meet Hooker. Uh, when he got to Chancellorsville, he again took a daring chance and divided his army a second time. Uh, General Stonewall Jackson took a part of the army and outflanked the right side of the Union forces. He then drove the 11th uh, Regiment down a plank road in panic. These soldiers panicked and ran right down this road right into the rest of the Union forces. And the whole army seemed to break into panic. At this point is where the 132nd comes in to this battle. Uh, they were one of Hooker's last lines of defense. As these panicked soldiers were running down the plank road through their lines, their job was to calm these soldiers, turn them around, and get them to fight again. And it was a very difficult job. Uh, one of the things that really saved the Union Army at this point, and it's kind of strange, uh, they brought the Army band up and they had the band playing the Star Spangled Banner. And as the panicked soldiers came running down the plank road, they seemed, when they heard, uh, and our flag was still there and this type of thing, calmed down, turned around, 
and, and with the 132nd and some other regiments actually held the line against Stonewall Jackson. Um, nightfall came and it was at this point that Jackson was out looking over his forward lines and was actually shot by his own men. Uh, Lee upon hearing this, at, at this point Jackson's left arm uh, was amputated and Lee heard that Jackson's left arm had been amputated and he said Jackson may have lost his left arm but I lost my right arm and it indeed was a blow to the Confederacy even though this was probably the most brilliant campaign Lee ever engineered uh, it was a blow to the Confederacy because in a few days Stonewall Jackson died uh, as the Union forces backed up uh, there's some controversy as to what Fighting Joe Hooker was doing during this time. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Albright had been promoted to Colonel Albright because of his bravery at the Battle of Fredericksburg. Uh, he actually went into the tent of Hooker and he believed in his writings he stated that he thought Hooker was drunk. And a lot of the facts seem to substantiate that in the fact that for eight hours no commands were given as to what the Union Army should do. And of course Lee was all over the place and they were just sitting there. And uh, had he been injured, as was the story, his next in command would have taken over and given some orders. But nothing took place. So um, Albright felt that he was intoxicated. Um, what Hooker then did when he did resume command was he just backed his army back across the Rappahannock and, and left in defeat, out of defeat. So uh, we had the Battle of Fredericksburg, a defeat for Burnside. Uh, that was in December. Then we go down to May, the first week in May. Uh, Fighting Joe Hooker is routed by Lee. Um, in a minute, I'm going to take you over to the site where uh, the 132nd was. As you can see, this is all woods and, and thick, thick places, and men were running through this very hard to fight in this, especially you can imagine what a, what a regiment of panicked men running through this kind of brush and thicket. Uh, it must have been a horrible situation with the Confederates right on their heels shooting at them. Um, and so we'll go to take a look at the exact spot where the 132nd held the line of defense against uh, Stonewall Jackson. This area right in here is the actual spot where the 132nd stood as part of uh, General Hooker's last stand against the Confederates at Chancellorsville. Uh, they, they succeeded in stopping the Confederates from pushing them any, any farther back and held this position for a day or so while Hooker's army retreated back across the river. Um, they were a very demoralized army at this time. They felt that their leadership had let them down, and I think they were right. Uh, for a whole day, while Lee maneuvered all over the place, the Union Army just sat here bottled up in Chancellorsville with superior numbers, but the Confederates were able to outmaneuver them with superior generaling. Uh, and so as this army moved out, they were very, very demoralized, uh, and it wasn't that the men didn't fight hard and, and weren't uh, patriotic and didn't believe in their cause. They just seemed to be not able to get a general equal to uh, Robert E. Lee or Stonewall Jackson. And it would take a little while longer before the Union would come up with a general to be the equal of those two. greatest crisis uh, Pennsylvania uh, had faced uh, in its history really was the invasion of uh, Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia in June, late June of 1863 en route to Gettysburg which would become the, the turning point of the war, one of the great turning points of the war. Because of that threat, uh, uh, weeks in advance, as much as two weeks in advance, local newspapers were following the course of Robert E. Lee's armies. Uh, up to the Pennsylvania border. When they crossed the border, it would have been uh, late June of 1863. And at that time, uh, 
feelings uh, on the town levels uh, throughout Pennsylvania were at a fever pitch. There was uh, very much, uh, uh, <laughs> things were very uh, tight between uh, people wanting to have recruits uh, and emergency troops raised uh, you know, very quickly. And General Albright, because of that threat to Pennsylvania, felt it his duty to uh, help raise a militia, and he did so. He raised the 34th Pennsylvania Militia in response to General Lee's uh, invasion of Pennsylvania in late June of 1863. They did that uh, very quickly. They, they raised a, a company and finally a, an actual militia, and they were en route to uh, uh, the southern border uh, where they knew of the fighting taking place, and uh, by the time they reached uh, the Harrisburg area, the fighting had already been decided and Lee had been turned back. Now as far as the, uh, the rest of the coal region community, I can't think of any other patriotic town than the town of Mok Chunk that was able to rally a, or muster a, a troop, a militia troop, that fast. Today we're uh, filming on a balcony which was once uh, the American Hotel in Mok Chunk. Mok Chunk changed its name to Jim Thorpe in 1954. But during the Civil War period, this balcony would have been used by General Charles Albright as a place for addressing uh, recruits. Uh, there were very m many uh, patriotic speeches made from this balcony by the general, and he was known as a master recruiter. Uh, this town uh, turned out probably one of the highest ratios of recruits, enlisted men, to the population number in the, the Union. I think there were 2,000 men recruited in this town, and the population, the overall population, was about 21,000. So that was a real high ratio, and it was due a lot in part to the uh, recruiting efforts of General Albright. Um, this sword is uh, an example of uh, Roby craftsmanship that was made for uh, uh, Colonel Albright of the uh, 202nd Pennsylvania Infantry. Uh, it's kind of interesting as to why uh, uh, the Pennsylvania troops would uh, present this to Colonel Albright, uh, uh, present this uh, Chelmsford sword to Colonel Albright when uh, maybe they could have gotten one from Horstman of Philadelphia just as easily. <laughs> But anyway, it's a fine example of a, of a field, field grade officer's sword. Uh, uh, the, the guard is kind of a, a half basket hilt with a U.S. Uh, pierced in the, in the guard. Um, the, uh, the grip is uh, solid silver. It's one piece silver. And uh, the, uh, the finial is an eagle's head. Uh, the uh, top locket, it looks, looks to be uh, uh, a figure of Columbia uh, holding, supporting a federal shield. And uh, the mid locket uh, appears to be a uh, infantryman uh, in his uh, rain gear and uh, uh, knapsack. He has a little US on his cart cart cartridge box. Um, probably uh, reminding the uh, colonel of uh, his troops and the Union cause. This is a, the uh, blade uh, looks to be uh, the same kind of blade that would be used on a uh, cavalry saber, but uh, it's been uh, engraved uh, or etched uh, with uh, uh, federal eagles and uh, the letters U.S. and uh, uh, Roby's Roby's uh, mark is is on here. It's C. Roby and Company, West Chelmsford, Massachusetts. Yeah, pays to advertise. It's a fine example of a presentation uh, officer's saber of the Civil War period. General Albright had a, 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 an important uh, role uh, near the end of the war with the 202nd uh, Regiment, which he helped raise. 
Uh, he was put um, as an, it seemed to be like a policing type duty at the time, but it was actually a, a, a pretty delicate job. He was faced with, uh, in many cases, dealing with partisans and guerrilla types uh, uh, of like a, a John Mosby, a Colonel John Mosby. And uh, for that reason alone, it was hazardous duty. His, his job was to pro uh, protect the Union Railroads um, in uh, south of Washington, D.C. And it was a, a critical job because they had to maintain that, uh, that transportation link. And um, in one case, uh, the case which is probably most famous for uh, General Albright, the, uh, the place where he actually won his brevet to Brigadier General, was in uh, defeating a group of Mosby's men while protecting it, uh, the railroad, or doing this police type work. Um, the account goes that he, he rode full force into a, a group of the enemy and uh, he had his pistols blazing. And this wasn't uncharacteristic. There are cases too in the Civil War, uh, the cases of Antietam and uh, Fredericksburg, where he was a, a strong leader of men, where he would have been uh, fearless in battle and he earned his spurs in those, those engagements also. But it was at the, uh, the engagement uh, in the uh, face, face off with uh, Mosby's guerrillas that he actually won his uh, brevet brigadier generalship in 1864. Oh, Troop F is uh, kind of a, uh, that's Christopher Roby's uh, uh, unit that he organized uh, during the Civil War as a cavalry troop. And they were called out to uh, respond to the Confederate raid up at St. Albans. Uh, it really threw the whole Northeast frontier into a tiz because uh, uh, they expected further raids. That was not the only isolated one and they had good evidence that there were, there were more uh, raids planned and uh, the, uh, the independent volunteer uh, militia was going to be relied on to uh, uh, respond uh, to any further incursions. Uh, they burnt uh, some buildings, they, they uh, wounded eight people and murdered one, and uh, uh, they uh, robbed three banks. They took over $200,000. Uh, supposedly, it was going to be turned over to the Con uh, Confederate States of America Treasury, uh, but there was an uh, indication that um, they had planned more raids of this sort in the area. So the uh, Troop F would uh, conceivably uh, be uh, called out again and again if this, this was uh, going to recur. Um, they, they were recalled uh, the, the following day because they did capture the raiders, and, uh, uh, but the Canadian government let them go. The town of Mock Chunk during the Civil War was a, a, a split town. There were uh, a good, goodly number of Democrats, which were called uh, <laughs> pro-peace type Democrats, which uh, General Albright really didn't like at all. Uh, because of that, uh, he would have had his enemies as far as the peace Democrats and the Copperheads. The Union forces, on the other hand, the pro-Lincoln forces, would have been uh, supportive of him and would have admired the man as a, a strong Unionist who didn't uh, believe in any case that this Union should be divided. So he was very pro-state and uh, pro-Lincoln and pro-Pennsylvania because Andrew Curtin was also a pro-Lincoln uh, governor at the time. I understand he was a... a a hero of the war, he was very dedicated, very, very dedicated, uh, a loyal citizen. And I think he was uh, extremely strong in his views. I, I think a lot of times that he may, I presume that he may have interpreted the, uh, the miners who were working for a better working condition. Boys were getting killed in the mine as young as seven years old. People were up to uh, talk with one, uh, read one article, a man in this, he was nine years old, went into the coal breaker, start working. By 16, he graduated into a, uh, into a, a labor in the mines. By 20, he managed to get a teaching certificate. 
by, by age 40, he died from lung disease in that short period of time in his early careers. So the working conditions were very bad. So I think in the early stages of the war, the, I think maybe possibly General Albright misinterpreted some of those strikes as anti-war efforts. I think it was primarily for bad working conditions. And I think in his dedication, and, uh, he probably in, felt that would be anti, uh, very unpatriotic. So I think he misinterpreted sometimes, maybe exaggerated. General Albright was uh, involved in politics, uh, as far as I could tell, from 1860 when he was a delegate to the Republican convention to nominate Abraham Lincoln. After the, the war ended, he, he re-entered uh, politics. He, he uh, took off his uniform and uh, his role as a soldier and took on the, the role of a, a statesman and citizen. And uh, he became a uh, state representative, a U.S. representative, uh, after the war ended, a, a one-termer. He served for two or three years, I believe. So he was a statesman. He knew his way around uh, political circles. Um, there was uh, correspondence between uh, uh, General Albright and Andrew Curtin throughout uh, the Civil War. And even in some instances, he went all the way to the top and corresponded with Abraham Lincoln. So he knew his way around the political circles. Also I think it's interesting that while he, all this was going on, he was also postmaster. Now, Normally, that's a full-time job for somebody. And yet, he was able to fulfill that for a number of years. Uh, I, I don't know if you have seen the uh, uh, cache, the envelope cache that was used by the Roby Manufacturing Company. But uh, uh, he had his envelope, his business envelopes, printed with uh, uh, a, a cache that uh, was a logo for his for the Roby Sword Company, as well as uh, he made his own hand cancel stamp, which was a Masonic square and compasses. Um, I, I think his, uh, his appointment as uh, postmaster of Chelmsford uh, must have been uh, kind of an interesting occasion. And uh, I think that uh, it would be interesting to know more about uh, how he went about uh, fulfilling that function. One thing I, I grew to understand about Charles Albright uh, from my reading of him and researching on him was that he was strictly a, a law enforcement type individual and a very pro-constitution individual. He believed in the death sentence wholeheartedly for criminals who, who took another life. He believed in the death sentence at that time. And uh, because of the, the hardships uh, caused in the coal regions, uh, through the 1860s and 1870s. Uh, there was uh, destruction of the coal pits, uh, the coal apparatus, but also there were debts. There were actual uh, um, debts to mine owners and individuals. And in one case in Tamaqua, there was a policeman killed also. And the finger pointing, the blame was all, all, always, almost to a, a, every instance of a, a death of that nature, uh, pointed at the Irish. and. Uh, because of that, uh, General Albright would have been uh, totally uh, opposed to any kind of uh, rebels who were against the Constitution and the, uh, the law and order type uh, system which he espoused to. So he was definitely uh, pro-union. He was also pro-government, pro-law and order, and he, he was also pro-capital uh, punishment. Many of them came over from, from Ireland after the potato famine, during the potato famine, and they were working, in, they had to work. They were working six days a week. As you, if the oldest uh, member of the family could not pay the company store's rent, the company, they would have to send the, the youngest, as young as seven years old, to help pay for the, the rent in the company store. They were working six days a week for minimal wages, and they were kept at the lower echelon. They had no rights. Uh, probably very, they were basically a slave and were working in and around the mines. So they, they always tried to better themselves and work out. And then the, because the, 
the influence of the, uh, the railroads ultimately took over many of the coal operations. So they had the complete monopoly between the, the supplying of the coal, the shipping of the coal, and then getting together in New York City every, every year to set prices. They had a, a cartel. It was referred to as the Great Combination. So they controlled everything except they could not control the, the laborer. So when, they, so when the laborers reacted asking for better wages, they, they were not given any. They were not given their fair shake. And uh, so they, they reacted violent. In other words, when, you, when you're down and out and you're, 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 your children are getting killed in the mines and dying of lung, lung disease and everything else, they had to retaliate. And I think they maybe have, some of them have every, for every reaction is a reaction, so both sides were reacting in violent, violent days. There, were, there was an also a group called the, the Modocs or Murdochs, which was a uh, vigilante type basically uh, the anti-Irish Catholic. So there was both sides, however, in when Pinkerton, when he wrote his uh, books on the subject, naturally he was, uh, shall we say, a little prejudiced. Yes. And uh, so that, that side always came out, and I think in recent years, the other side is beginning to come out. General Albright, as a, a, a prosecutor uh, in the Molly Maguire trials, would have been uh, wholeheartedly uh, in back of what he believed. He, he wasn't one to back down to any kind of pressure. And if he had a cause, uh, whether it be the Union cause in the Civil War, or re recruiting men for that cause, or uh, uh, putting, to, uh, uh, putting to trial uh, perpetrators of uh, destruction, and even uh, perpetrators of murder, he would have wholeheartedly be, uh, been behind a, a cause of that type. He was a kind of individual that didn't back down. He was strong. He was uh, very intensely uh, oriented toward uh, bringing about justice. And uh, because of that, uh, he was an able prosecutor in the, the Molly Maguire trials. Basically, up in there were there were some of the major riots against the draft was in in New York. They had you know, and also up in a little town called Audrey. It's hardly even existing today. It's a small little mining town. Probably the population right now might be a few hundred people. It was a uh, a hotbed of uh, I think some of the men that were some of the original volunteers. One one colliery owner, the mine operator. Mr. Smith. He was, according to various books I've written, supplying names to the, probably the more radical, let's say the buckshots, to, uh, the, to the draft board, to the provost marshal. Now, I don't, I'm not sure whether Albright was in there. Some people say Albright was acting as the recruiting officer in Carbon County, in Mark Chunk. So if Mr. S I know the day Mr. Smith, the day before he was killed, the provost marshal left the draft list on his, in his store rather than serving the men. So they left it up to Mr. Smith to hand out these, these names. So there's a lot of hate built up over these years against, and uh, it points out that Mr. Smith, Mr. and Mrs. Smith were coming by, by their two horse carriage to Mark Chunk to pick up ammunition and supplies for their store. Mr. Smith is killed. Okay, now we go in. Uh, during those violent days, uh, there were several men that were arrested, anti-draft. Anti so Thomas Fisher was thrown in jail uh, because of he got in, into a fight one night at the bar, and he and a fellow by the name of Campbell, not John Campbell, and several others were thrown in jail. Again, against the uh, arguing, the pros and cons of the, of the Civil War and the draft and everything else, and, Anyway, they threw him in jail. In the meantime, Albright now is General Albright, or Mr. Albright, was writing to President Lincoln, Lincoln, criticizing the draft dodgers, very similar to the Vietnamese War. He asked for troops to help uh, settle down the Irish. In the meantime, of course, Albright then goes to the war and eventually comes out a general. The man I referred to, Thomas Fisher, was thrown in jail. 
work, uh, work for the, I think in his whole life, he worked for the uh, Lehigh Wilkesboro Coal Company under Mr. Parrish. He went from several other communities, he ended up over in, the, in Summit Hill. After the war, Albright comes out, General Albright comes out and works for the Wilkesboro Coal Company. Fisher also works for the Wilkesboro Coal Company. A coal company, uh, Morgan Powell, is killed. Prior to that time, uh, Thomas Fisher was involved in labor negotiations, getting the miners back to work during the long strike. And he had a meeting with Mr. Parrish down here in, in Mock Chunk, Jim Thorpe, and there was apparently some rather violent words spoken. The men went back to work, but there was still a grievance. So Thomas Fisher asked Parrish to come down back to Mock Chunk and renegotiate, which he did. The miners went back to work. In the meantime, Campbell was arrested for another crime. And there was another gentleman by the name of Lysingring who had his large home next to Asa Packer. He was involved with the Wilkesboro Coal Company and involved with the labor negotiations. He then wrote, he says, I'm, I'm worried about me because I was, I, I know from Campbell and are they after me? So he writes a letter to Mr. Lysingring, a friend of his who he's worked under for years. Mr. Lysingring casually mentioned that letter to Mr. Albright. The letters demanded for coming over to Albright. Fisher's arrested. General Albright puts his uniform on and prosecutes Fisher. The draft dodger, I got you. So was he talking to a Molly or was he talking to a buckshot? During the whole, then, of course, Fisher was a uh, a member of the Ancient Order of Hibernian, which would be a, the beneficial group, health benefits, sick benefits. In, in the prosecuting, in the cases, uh, the attorney Albright would purposely intermix those names, the buckshots, which are not a very popular item, along with the terrorist group, along with the legitimate AOH, consistently intermix those three categories so that the, the jury, which was primarily uh, many Germans coming in from the Im immigrants who spoke some English, or they spoke English, but they, they, to comprehend their, the, uh, the English language, they couldn't quite comprehend what he was saying. And in a little sideline side in uh, Albright's uh, classified ads, he says, German is, is fluent in our, in our office. So the, in his little byline, Underneath, he mentions German, which puts him in, in awe with, the, with the, the immigrants coming in. And then when he appears in, in full military uniform, I think he's prosecuting the traitors, not necessarily the Mollies. During the, during the trials, uh, we, we talked earlier about Mr. Lysingring. He, he knew Mr. Fisher, Tom Fisher, very well. I studied Fisher because everybody's been, a lot of people have been following Campbell and Keyhole. So I, I thought, well, well, no one knew about Tom Fisher. But during, when, when Mr. Lysingring was brought on the stand as a, a friend of Mr. Fisher, he, Lysingring, talked about Fisher being as very honest and honorable and a hard worker and dedicated, and he knows nothing about him that is detrimental to the character. Uh, General Albright then would say, Mr. Mr. Lysingring, is it, not, it is, is it not so that Mr. Fisher almost beat up a man in, in Audrey? I, how can you answer that? And he asked many, is it not so that he's a member of the Mullen McGuire's? And Mr. Lysingring would say, I don't know. And then he would go on and say, is he not a buckshot? Didn't he, didn't he spend some time in jail? Did, is, always with... It, it, is it not so? Uh, it, it's very difficult to answer. Mr. Leisinger in Quebec, because he was a professional, with long answers. But General Albright, in his dedication, would say, how can you sit on the stand there, Mr. Leisinger, 
knowing that he's a member of this and he's a buckshot and, and, and still vouch for his character. Mr. Leisinger, how, how can you still stand, stand up for this man that we, we know is a, a terrorist? Now he's speaking primarily to a, an immigrant jury with his complete uniform on and most of the jury would respect the military authority, having won the Civil War and uh, having the, the background of the European. So this, this was a, what was brought out in the whole trial. And then the, uh, many of the uh, character witnesses against these, these men, have, you have Kerrigan, you have Mulhern, several of them, have already been found guilty in sitting in the Pottsville jail. And then modern terminology would be plea bargain. In those days, they call them squealers. So they would come over here and squeal their, their heart's content. Uh, Mr. Kerrigan, who was uh, involved with many of the trials, in fact, immediately prior to this particular, the, uh, one of the last trials that Mr. Albert was in, involved in, uh, was given a promissory note for $1,000 by the county commissioners of Carbon County. And he was sent back to Pottsville and was released. Now, $1,000 to Mr. Kerrigan, the squealer who was a who happens to be, coincidentally, he did go to the army. He was an ally for Mr. Albright. Not, I'm not saying that factually, but it's, uh, Albright would respect Kerrigan, the squealer, more than he would uh, someone else. It, it implies an awful lot. General Albright was a dedicated soldier, and in his letters and speeches, he always said, death to the traitors. Traitor, and they're traitors forever. So in, in Albright's thinking, these men were traitors. And no, he, uh, no quarters asked, no quarters given. So I think when he had these men on the stand, he would do everything in his power to make sure that they were convicted and hanged. I'm here at the old jail in Mount Chun, Pennsylvania. This is the site where four Molly McGuire's were hanged. Uh, this is a replica of the gallows. They set it up right here in the jail itself. Uh, they wanted to hang four at one time for impact. Um, General Charles Albright was, was here as a witness when they were hanged. Uh, he was also one of the chief prosecutors of these men. Uh, it was almost a circus type atmosphere. This jail was crowded with people just waiting to see these four supposed terrorists hanged. Several days before the, the hangings took place, backing up a little bit, they, uh, they constructed the gallows right in, in the cell block. Some say two days before, some say several days before. The, the gallows was redesigned to accommodate four men at the same time. In my thinking is, since everything was done professionally well, they, they want to get the message out. So they brought in the national press, I mean, all the press corps, I mean, all the, they didn't call it the press corps in those days, the newspaper reporters. And they put them all up on the balcony. And then when they were to hang them in, they uh, these redesigned the gallows to accommodate four men. So if you hang four men at the same time, you get more sensational, you get more press coverage. And then if there's anybody thinking about creating a union in West Virginia, Colorado, uh, they, they would get the message. Uh, many of the local uh, coal barons and men of affluent were involved with Kemmerer, Colorado. Kemmerer is from town here. Uh, Lehigh Ra Valley Railroad was involved in West Virginia. Packer was uh, in West Virginia. And the Reading Railroad was in West Virginia and Kentucky, so they were, they were getting the message out by hanging four men at the same time. It was covered, covered in all national newspapers. The, it was a, more or less, they tried to keep it from uh, a circus atmosphere the way it was open in Bloomsburg years later. But they, they did open up the, all the visitors were coming in the day or two before, talking with the prisoners, all the reporters, including members of the, of the, the men who were being hanged, as well as the uh, uh, Mrs. Jones, for instance, was in here with her family, and there was 
naturally conflicts and embarrassments and crying and a very emotional time. But Mrs. Jones, as I understand, wanted to either pull the rope or, or, or be there. And uh, it was not politically proper to do, I'm sure, because they, they had uh, it all, all set up who was going to do what. As I understand, they, they instructed the, uh, uh, according to Mr. Campbell's book, uh, Asa Packer was involved with bringing up uh, a gentleman who instructed the, the local sheriff how to hang the man. And here again, if you, and I'm not an authority on hangings or anything else, I don't profess to be, but they, in any thousand of people coming through the jail, they, they, they mentioned that in the old days, if you want to strangle a man, you put the noose up behind the man's neck. He will strangle. He would be more, uh, more of a show person for the gallery of the reporters. If you want to hang a man, you put up behind the ear where the neck breaks, and uh, it's a matter of several minutes before the man dies. In this case, they were up to 12, 13 minutes. After four minutes, the doctors would all go up and, and check everything out, so it was, it was chaotic. I mean, it was gruesome. I mean, I can't comprehend it, what man will do to man. Campbell proclaimed his innocence right to the very end. On the morning that he was supposed to be hanged, when the jailers came to his cell, Campbell reached down and in the dust of the cell floor, took his hand and put it on the wall and proclaimed that his handprint would remain there forever to show the world that an innocent man was hanged that day. A few years ago they had a mock trial and Campbell was found innocent. But I guess that didn't satisfy him because even today, his handprint can be seen on the cell wall. The, uh, the caskets were in this room. They made the caskets up and they laid them out in the living room here. The family waiting for, for the bodies were across the street in these small homes across the street. And then the, the procession went up eight, eight miles to Summer Hill for Fisher and all that. This is the final resting place of General Charles Albright up on top of a mountain in Mao Chunk. Also buried in this tomb is his wife Naomi and his daughter Annie. Um, General Albright only lived to be 49 years old and died at a very young age. His wife only outlived him a few more years and his daughter died before him uh, just three months after she was married. Uh, he, ne he left no living relatives. A little over a decade after General Charles Albright was laid to rest in Mount Chunk, Pennsylvania, Captain Roby was buried in this quiet West Chelmsford Cemetery. The lives of both men paralleled each other in quite a few instances. For instance, they were both active members of their churches. Christopher Roby was an active Mason uh, General Charles Albright was on the building committee on the church in Mount Chunk, Pennsylvania. Uh, both men established reserve units. Captain Roby uh, formed Troop F in Chelmsford and General Albright formed the 34th Pennsylvania militia in, to uh, help defend the coal fields which the coal from those coal fields came up here to Chelmsford to fire the furnaces in Captain Roby's sword factory. Uh, both men met President Grant. Uh, Captain Roby escorted President Grant from Fitchburg to Lexington and Concord on the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Lexington and Concord. And General Grant went to uh, General Albright's home in Mao Chunk. Um, both men were politicians. Captain Roby was a state rep from Chelmsford and uh, General Albright was a congressman from Pennsylvania. Uh, both men were very civic minded, uh, doing a lot of things in their town and both men died without ever knowing that their histories would be intertwined forever with this sword.